so we are going live uh, hi everyone uh, i am prabhat and i welcome uh, you all on behalf of csds uh, today we have uh, with us a historian and dear friend dr amelia bonia from university of heidelberg uh, amelia bonia is a historian of south asia and british empire uh, with a particular interest in media science technology and medicine she was educated at Tokyo University in Japan and then in University of Heidelberg, Germany. At Heidelberg during PhD years, I got to know Amelia and her fascinating work, which became her first monograph, The News of Empire, Calligraphy, Journalism and the Politics of Reporting in Colonial India. <clears throat> it was published by Oxford University Press in 2016. And this book was awarded 2017 Eugenia M. Pamigiano prize for the history of journalism by American History Association. <laughs> she has also co-edited uh, another book, Anxious Times, Medicine and Modernity in 19th Century Britain, published by University of Pittsburgh Press in 2019. And uh, this was part of uh, the European Research Council funded research project uh, titled Diseases of Modern Life, based at University of Oxford. Uh, so apart from these uh, two books, uh, she has also published a number of essays in various reputed journals such as technology and culture and so forth. Uh, Amelia is also a multilingual scholar. Apart from English, she has also published in Japanese and Romanian. <clears throat> Moving away from her uh, past uh, achievements, now I'm going to talk about her current research project. Uh, Amelia is a research fellow at University of Heidelberg now, where she leads a new project uh, called Archives of the Earth, Fossils, Science and Historical Imaginaries in 20th Century India, funded by DFG, uh, German Research Foundation. Uh, this new project aims to write a history of paleo sciences in colonial and post-colonial India, uh, its connections and entanglements across regions from Britain and Germany to China and Japan. It deals with the specificities of the extractivist nature of this knowledge form and invisibilization of women practitioners of science therein and so forth. Uh, so her presentation today, uh, which is titled Footnotes of History, Fossils, Gender and the Making of Paleo Sciences in 20th Century India is part of this ongoing project. Welcome, Amelia. <clears throat> the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Prabhat. Let me just try to share my screen again hopefully it will work i tend to put the slides yeah i think that should be okay right um thank you Prabhat, for the introduction and thank you also for the invitation to uh, present my work as part of this forum it's uh, wonderful to be back in delhi a bit only virtually at this stage and it's a privilege to be in the company of uh, such inspiring scholars, uh, some of whom uh, also happen to be old friends from my uh, PhD days, as you've just heard. Uh, so I'll begin with a brief description of my current project uh, called the uh, Archives of the Earth, uh, Fossil Science and Historical Imaginaries in 20th Century India, which, uh, as you've heard, um, is uh, funded by the German Research Foundation and on which today's talk is based. And then I will discuss in more detail uh, one aspect of that project, namely the role of women in the making and uh, uh, making of paleoscientific knowledge and uh, the institutionalization of paleosciences, especially uh, paleobotany and paleontology in 20th century India. I like to tell people that uh, my current project is not only about footnotes of history, uh, be they topics of research such as women in science or um, even more eccentrically, India's fossil heritage, uh, but the project itself actually grew out uh, of a footnote. Uh, a footnote in my first monograph about journalism and technologies of communication uh, in colonial India. Um, a footnote about a man named uh, uh, Ruchi Ramsani, who in the mid 1880s used to work as an assistant meteorological reporter to the government of India. And he caught my eye because he was the only Indian working uh, in uh, that department in such a senior position. So I started searching for information about his life uh, and found out that he had a distinguished career as a professor of science uh, at Government College Lahore and science popularizer in Punjab. Uh, but he also traveled very interestingly to Karlsruhe and Heidelberg in 1914 uh, to work with German scientists on radioactivity. 
eventually ending up in Manchester in the laboratory of Nobel Prize winner Ernest Stratford. So I wrote a paper on him and uh, another Japanese physicist who followed the same scientific trail uh, through Germany and Britain, after which I realized that the next generation of the Sani family was equally intriguing uh, and had played an important role in the institutionalization of paleo sciences uh, in India. So you can see here in this slide, one son, uh, Birbal uh, became a world famous paleobotanist and uh, established what is now known as the uh, Birbal Sani Institute of Paleo Sciences in Lucknow or the BSIP. Um, so if you're wondering why this is important at all, um, uh, perhaps it helps to remember that at the time of its establishment in 1946, uh, the BSIP was one of only two institutions in the world. Uh, dedicated specifically to the study of paleobotany, uh, the other one being the Paleontological Laboratories at the Pennsylvania State University. And Birbal's younger brother, Mulk Raj, was a geologist and a paleontologist uh, who worked for the Geological Survey of India uh, as a superintending uh, geologist, but was also the founder president of the Paleontological Society of India in 1950. So in brief, this is how I moved from a project on journalism and telecommunications to one about paleo sciences uh, in 20th century India, uh, more specifically the six decades between the 1910s uh, and the 1960s. And one aim of the project is to bridge the colonial and post-colonial divide as far as the history of science in South Asia is concerned. And the other is to overcome this India-Britain dichotomy by documenting less explored, uh, but nevertheless important connections to German, Swiss, uh, American, and Japanese science. And in fact, as I have recently come to find out, there are even connections to my own country of birth, Romania, uh, because in 1973, at the height of the communist regime, uh, Romanian paleontologist Dan Grigorescu, who might be here today, <laughs> visited the uh, Indian Statistical Institute uh, at the invitation of S.L. Jain, and he even conducted fieldwork in various parts of India. Uh, now, Jane is a well known, was a well-known paleontologist, um, as also demonstrated by the fact that the Jainosaurus, a genus of dinosaur that lived in India and other parts of Asia some 60, 70 million years ago, uh, was named after him. So in other words, this is a very um, ambitious project, uh, which I hope will result in a monograph about the global entanglements of paleo sciences uh, in 20th century India. Now, I do not want to move on without uh, acknowledging a few uh, depths, uh, because unfortunately the beginning of this project coincided with the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, so the only stint of fieldwork I've managed to conduct to date has been uh, in the UK in uh, January 2020. Uh, and I'm hoping that this year I will be able to make up for some of this uh, lost time and resume travel. Uh, but I must say that I have been extremely fortunate to collaborate with a number of people whose names I would like to acknowledge here, uh, because this project would not have gotten this far uh, without their, ha their help. And one is Professor Ashok Sani, uh, one of India's best known paleontologists, who I believe is also present here today, and who has generously opened his family archives to me and provided assistance in uh, countless other ways. Uh, the other is Dr. Advait Zucker, a paleontologist based at Yale, uh, who must receive credit for teaching me pretty much everything I know about paleontology, uh, for showing me how Indian fossils actually look like, uh, and uh, for many debates about the history of paleontology. And I also cannot thank enough uh, Orgomana, who is a brilliant illustrator and who collected materials for me during the pandemic at the Indian Statistical Institute in Kolkata. And finally, Smriti Verma, uh, another brilliant uh, MA student uh, who did the same at uh, Tin Morty. So thank you again uh, uh, to all these collaborators. Um, now, let me say a few things about paleo sciences and what it is that they study. Uh, most of us probably think about dinosaurs when we hear the word paleontology. Um, unfortunately, paleobotany is even less known, uh, probably also because fossil plants have always attracted less attention than fossil animals. And when we think about uh, dinosaurs, we usually think about specimens like this one, the famous T-Rex. Uh, and we would be forgiven for making that association considering the fact that uh, North American dinosaurs are not only fascinating beasts in their own right, uh, but their public image has also benefited from an extensive campaign of mediatization. 
uh, as demonstrated by numerous museum exhibitions, films, uh, literary works, and more recently, of course, uh, the uh, internet. But what I hope to achieve uh, with this project are two main things. Um, firstly, to shift attention from the Anglo-American scenario and place India and its rich fossil heritage at the center of my investigations, uh, thus raising awareness about its historical and scientific significance. And secondly, document some of the ways in which uh, paleoscientific knowledge has been uh, relevant socially, politically, and economically. Uh, for example, with regards to the exploitation of natural resources, uh, climate change research, and even the writing of history. Um, as the names also suggest, uh, paleobotanists and paleontologists study plant and animal fossils across a wide geological time scale. But we historians don't usually go that far back in time, but paleoscientists challenge us to stretch our imagination into the very deep past. Uh, and they study fossils comparatively and relationally. For example, in order to develop taxonomic classifications, produce insights about the evolution of life on Earth, the location of natural resources like coal and oil, and variations in climatic and environmental conditions. So the process of making uh, paleoscientific knowledge is also a process of establishing relations between different parts of the world of weaving the earth into a web of temporal and historical uh, uh, connections that pertain both to the natural world and to social cultural aspects of it. Um, and I will give you an example from uh, Birbal Sani's work, whom I have mentioned earlier. As a quick uh, biographical note, he was born uh, in uh, 1891 in Dehra, now in Pakistan. Uh, not far away from the salt range system he went on to study, and he was educated at Cambridge under botanist and geologist uh, A.C. Seward, who became his mentor and who converted him to the study of paleobotany. Um, upon his return to India, he first taught in uh, Varanasi in Punjab and then became a professor of uh, botany in Lucknow in 1921, uh, where he was to remain until his death in uh, 1949. He was a prolific researcher and writer um, whose revision of uh, the Indian flora uh, based on work conducted in the salt, salt range, uh, but also on the Karewas of Kashmir uh, and the Himalayan uplift consecrated him as a paleobotanist of international uh, repute. It's also interesting that as an educator, he trained future generations of scientists, um, including the Chinese paleobotanist Shu Ren, who received his PhD in um, Lucknow. And as you can see in this slide, my uh, colleague Arnab Ghosh has written a very interesting paper on him. Uh, and he was also um, responsible for preparing the uh, Indian edition of uh, J.M. Lawson's textbook of botany, a teaching tool that was widely used in India uh, in the 20th century. Uh, now, like many of his uh, fellow paleoscientists, uh, Sani also maintained an active interest uh, um, in Sanskrit archaeology and history, uh, which resulted in publications such as uh, this book, The Technique of Casting Coins in Ancient India, uh, and an article published in 1936 in the journal Current Science called The Himalayan Uplift Since the Advent of Man, its Cult Historical Significance. Uh, and I'm going to read the, the first paragraph of this paper because it's a fascinating plea for interdisciplinarity uh, at a time when scientific boundaries were hardening through so processes of uh, professionalization and institutionalization. But it's also an example of how paleoscientists try to weave together different ideas or different conceptions of time. So he says, in this age of specialization, which inevitably tends to confine thought in compartments, one is apt to overlook or to underrate the bearings of one branch of science upon another. A paleobotanist or a geologist, accustomed to think of time in millions of years, stumbles upon an archaeological discovery which at once brings him down to the human epoch. It forces his attention to the wanderings of man since the time he began to leave signs of his handiwork in the form of stone or metal implements, inscriptions, coins, seals, or other monuments of his ever-increasing intelligence and power. The object of the present article is to draw attention to the significance of recent geological changes in northern India to the wanderings of prehistoric man. So what does Sani do in this article? He basically uses geological and paleontological knowledge to explain the processes through which the Himalayas were formed, uh, things like the folding and dragging up of the uh, Karewa beds on the Pir Panjal, the kind of fossils that were discovered there, etc. And then he brings this story 
from deep time into human time to conclude that during Paleolithic and Neolithic times, the passes between India and China were probably lower than they currently are, which suggested to him that cultural context between these two regions might have been possible via this direct, direct route across the Himalayas. So this is just one example of um, how these supposedly marginal scientific disciplines came to be relevant to broader socio-political and cultural agendas. And if you are looking for um, more examples, I suggest having a look at the uh, Sumati Ramaswamy's fascinating book, The Lost Land of Lemuria, which traces the incarnations of this lost continent across a broad range of cultural phenomena from Victorian paleo sciences to uh, Euro-American occultism and Tamil devotion in colonial and post-colonial uh, India. Uh, but equally importantly, the making of paleo scientific knowledge is predicated upon important processes of circulation. So during the period I study, fossils were often exchanged in order to be uh, examined, while scientists and their spouses traveled the world for study, field expeditions and scientific meetings, carrying along ideas and even material objects like uh, specimens or scientific publications. And I am going to um, give you an example from the work of one of Birpal Sani's students, uh, paleobotanist China Virki, also known as uh, China Jacob um, after marriage, uh, who in 1939 published a paper that sought to prove the, the existence of spores in the glacial matrix of Gondwana land, this uh, supercontinent that uh, was formed some 500 million years ago, uh, and it's believed to have looked something like in this uh, uh, image. So I discovered uh, China Virki only recently, so I know I still know little about her. And what I know comes from a few scientific articles, um, a letter sent by uh, Birbal Sani to uh, Lady uh, Abla Bos, uh, Jagdish Chandra Bos's uh, widow, uh, in which she explains that she was from Malabar um, and was one of his brightest students, uh, whose PhD thesis had been highly praised by his former supervisor, uh, AC Seward in Cambridge. Uh, and that he was seeking to obtain a scholarship for her at the Bose Institute, uh, presumably so she could move to Calcutta to uh, join her husband, um, whom you can also see uh, in, this, uh, uh, in this slide, and who had also studied uh, under Bia Balsani, and with whom she went on to publish a number of papers. Um, indeed, there is an interesting mention uh, of her in her husband's obituary, uh, I quote, Many of the younger generation may not know that his gracious life partner, Dr. China Jacob, was a pioneer in palynological studies in India. And so palynology is the branch of uh, biology that studies mostly micro fossils like uh, spor uh, spores and uh, pollen. So the sediments uh, that China Virki examined as a research student uh, at the Department of Botany in Lucknow had been sent to her uh, by the authorities at the British Museum. So they were sent from the British Museum, but the fragments themselves were not from Britain. They were fragments of Gondwana rocks from the Cape Colony in South Africa and Australia. So they sent them basically from South Africa and Australia to Britain, and then from there they were sent to uh, like now so she could, uh, she could study them. Um, a similar example comes from correspondence I discovered in the archives of the University of Freiburg here in Germany. Um, in which British paleontologist Pamela Robinson, to whom I shall return later, uh, talks about the difficulties encountered by Indian paleo scientists, um, and chief among them was the lack of comparative material. So they didn't have specimens they could compare uh, when, when they uh, engaged in uh, paleo scientific studies. So she tried to convince one of the German paleontologists, Friedrich von Hune, to send to the Indian Statistical Institute in Calcutta casts of some of his materials, uh, such as this uh, interesting um, specimen. Um, and material from the same archives also provides insights into German-American paleontologist Kurt Teicher's collaboration with the Geological Survey of India in the 1930s. Uh, for example, the exchange of Australian and Indian fossil specimens, which Teicher secured on his, the basis of his then position at the University of Western Australia. So apart from demonstrating how far these fossils traveled via imperial and trans-imperial networks of science, um, examples like this also challenge us to think about India as a place where fossil science was made in its own right, and which also received fossil specimens as part of an elaborate network of scientific exchanges and collaborations. 
And this is important because former colonies of the British Empire usually feature in histories of science as laboratories of natural history or sites of field work. That is as places where fossils were collected and from which they traveled outwards rather than places which also receives occasionally fossils. And indeed nowadays many fossil collections from the Indian subcontinent are scattered across European and American museums, such as the Natural History Museum in London or the Yale Peabody Museum, and are difficult to access by underfunded scientists from the global south who often rely on international collaborations to study them. And the situation is a direct outcome of extractive colonial era practices of science making, many of which continue unfortunately undisturbed to this day. Now this finally brings me to the topic of women and gender in uh, paleo sciences and in earth sciences more generally. Um, and it's fair to say that uh, this part of my project is connected with my own disenchantment with how histories of science, not only in South Asia, but in many other parts of the world as well, have been written to date. Um, especially the fact that they tend to focus on the activity of male elite individual scientists, as opposed, for example, to broader communities of scientific practice and protagonists such as minor scientists, uh, women, amateurs, or institution builders, who have contributed to science in a variety of ways while working away from the limelight of such male elite science. And the situation is even more interesting in uh, the case of geology and earth sciences, where uh, recent scholarship on the British uh, context, uh, especially the late 19th and early 20th century, has demonstrated that women were often involved in the creation of geological knowledge as fossil collectors, uh, geological wives, daughters and sisters, or museum volunteers. Um, in the South Asian context, women have been conspicuously absent from histories of such fieldwork sciences like geology and paleontology, uh, which have long been considered unfavorable environments for women's scientific activity, not only in South Asia again, but pretty much in um, every other part of the world. However, I would urge you to look at, um, to have a look, uh, uh, if you have time, at the archives of science I've been creating in connection with this uh, project, which feature interviews with uh, women uh, earth scientists uh, uh, in India. And you will notice that one of the things they always make a point to emphasize is that they are not intimidated by fieldwork conditions. Uh, on the contrary, they welcome these challenges. Uh, and indeed, if we go back in time to the period that I studied for this project, uh, we noticed that there was a range of attitudes towards women's participation in fieldwork excursions. Um, we have some interesting examples in uh, Molk Raj Sani's uh, unpublished memoirs, um, in which he talks about his uh, brother Birbal's traverses in the Himalayas, uh, and mentions one particular trip in 1925, which uh, took him from Srinagar to Gulmarg. And he says, I quote, that uh, during this trek, the party which included his wife, uh, his wife Savitri, to whom I shall return shortly, was marooned on the snow at Chor Panjal and arrived at Gulmarg after considerable hardship. Uh, Mulk Rajasani also talks about his own work in the Lucky Range, uh, saying that, uh, I quote again, the safest place I could think of staying at Amri was for my Lucky Range survey was the railway station. We stayed in the waiting room for a few days. I traveled almost 25 miles daily merely to reach the Lucky Range, the area of my work and back and do a day's field work in addition. This meant leaving while it was still dark and making camp when it was even darker. Added to all this was the domestic front for I had no way of meeting the, the feminine argument that it was safer to die together than separately. My wife was virtually a prisoner in the Amri railway station waiting room and bore through all the hardships and risks bravely. Now, according to Professor Sani, his mother, uh, Shayama Sani, was not a scientist, but she had completed a master's degree in political science in the 1920s from the University of Lucknow. And because I was talking about the range of attitudes towards women's participation in fieldwork expeditions, um, I have another example for this time from the Japanese geologist uh, Teichi Kobayashi, who was a professor at my uh, alma mater, the University of Tokyo, and who wrote the following in a 1934 letter about a possible um, excursion in the Swiss Alps. So he says, by the way, I am accompanied by Mrs. Kobayashi, and she has no experience for long walk or mountain climbing. Therefore, I think she has to stay uh, at the hotel in such a case. 
Now, of course, from our perspective, it is hard to establish whether Mrs. Kobayashi did not like mountain climbing herself or whether other people decided on her behalf. But nevertheless, it's interesting to see what kind of, uh, in what kind of ways women actually participated uh, in such uh, uh, fieldwork uh, expeditions. So uh, to return to my uh, disenchantment with um, histories of science, uh, there are, of course, uh, in the context of uh, South Asia, a number of volumes dedicated specifically to women in science. Um, so it's not an uh, unstudied topic, uh, but the point I'm trying to make is that this works often stands separately from the mainstream, uh, in which the voices of women are still overwhelmingly erased or ignored. So in other words, um, in this project, I seek to recover the voices, uh, these voices to document uh, women's contributions to earth sciences on one hand, but also um, somehow to advance a broader agenda of writing a history of science in which questions about women and gender aren't just appendixes to other stories, but they're actually mainstreamed into those stories uh, as uh, uh, Londa Schivinger aptly put it. And to illustrate this, I would like to discuss uh, in more detail two other contributions to paleosciences in 20th century India, uh, which I've already mentioned in uh, passing before. Um, we have here a photograph of Savitri Sani uh, seated next to uh, Jawaharlal Nehru during the opening of the BSIP in uh, 1949. It was originally called the uh, Indian Institute of Paleobotany. Um, and in fact, interestingly, uh, Birva Sani wanted to call it the Savitri Sani Institute of Paleobotany. And it was housed within the Department of Botany and Geology of the University of Lucknow. Uh, it was established with donations from Birbal and uh, Savitri, uh, as well as financial support from the government of India, uh, the government of the United Provinces, and the Burma Oil Company, um, a situation that points to the connections between uh, paleo sciences and the exploitation of natural resources. Now, this is a topic I haven't uh, had time to discuss here, but uh, if you wish, we can uh, pick it up in the uh, Q&A afterwards. The, tragically, uh, Birbal passed away only a week after delivering this speech. Uh, and although she lacked formal training in science, and by all accounts, it's, it's difficult to find um, uh, information about her life, but she was likely not highly educated. Uh, Savitri went on to lead the institute, uh, the BSIP, for almost two decades after her husband's demise. Uh, so from 1949 until 1969. Uh, 69 was the year uh, when um, the BSIP was transferred to the Department of Science and Technology uh, of the Government of India, and Savitri Sani was nominated a life member of its governing body and went on to receive the Padma Shri in recognition of her contributions to BSIP and science more generally. So how exactly did she shape uh, the BSIP? Uh, firstly, she oversaw the construction of a new building for the Institute in the 1950s, um, when the directorship was offered to two scientists, you can see in this slide, uh, the British paleobotanist uh, Thomas Maxwell Harris uh, and the Norwegian paleobotanist Ove Arbo Hoek, uh, whose positions were financed uh, through UNESCO. And the correspondence between these two otherwise uh, eminent men makes for very interesting reading it's a very gender and at times also racially inflected language. Um, at the very least, it's clear that there were conflicting visions about the kind of institution of research and education the BSIP should become. Uh, Harris and Hoog were in agreement that the BSIP should remain a small affair because they argued um, India lacked the necessary human and financial resources and because its fossil record was insufficient and unremarkable. Uh, Savitri's vision, on the other hand, was more ambitious and perhaps more representative on the, of the enthusiasm that characterized the uh, uh, independent India, newly independent India. Like her husband, she valued international collaborations and thought they were indispensable for the development of science in the post-independence period. So she wanted to build an internationally renowned institute that could compete with other institutions around the world. And in fact, despite their squabbles, uh, even Hoog was forced to admit in a private letter to Paris sent in 1951 that, I quote, I admire the work Mrs. Sunny has done here. I do not doubt that she has the entire credit for the present existence of the Institute. Without her intensive work, it would not have been there at all now, end of quote. Um, I agree with this particular assessment of Hoogs, and I think we have here an example of a woman who was not formally trained as a scientist, uh, 
but who nevertheless made an important contribution to science as an institution builder. And this is something that's often forgotten, uh, despite the fact that we all know that enduring institutions of education actually have a big impact on future generations of students of science. But I would like to contrast this uh, little known story of institution building with Savitri's public image. Um, cultivating personal networks was central to her strategy of building the BSIP uh, during the 10, 20 years that she was at its helm. Um, she took charge uh, of her late husband's uh, correspondence with scientists around the world. Uh, she continued to travel abroad. So in August 1950, she, for example, she went to Stockholm uh, together with R.V. Sitole and uh, Professor Shuren, uh, members of the BSIP staff to attend the International Botanical Congress over which her, her husband had been expected to preside. And she was clearly in touch with um, Tore Gustav Halle, who was the head of the Swedish Museum of Natural History and at whose, ha whose house she was probably staying. And from where she wrote a letter to geologist Kurt Teichert, who was in Australia at the time, promising to send him copies uh, of Birba Sani's paper on the southern fossil floras and describing her attempts to build a new home for the BSIP that would replace the old bungalow they were using. And interestingly, she closed her letter with an invitation to Tyhert to visit Lucknow, pointing out that Australia, after all, is not so very far away from India. Only a beginning has to be made. And I personally believe a great deal in this personal context. So as this suggests, her life was defined primarily in relation to her husband, and her public role was that of, a, I quote, soft power. So these are all words that, uh, that were used in relation to her, that has advanced the cause of science, a sweet, soft-spoken and courteous, a graceful, fragile looking woman, who nevertheless nurtured the Institute with an iron will and determination, again, this is a quote, in the same way that a mother nurtures her children. And this was to become a recurring trope in accounts of Savitri Sani, uh, all the more so since her marriage to Birbal did not produce any children. Uh, so as one memorialist put it, um, the BSAP became, I quote, her only child, her husband's living memorial, end of quote. And interestingly, it was also very transnational trope, as we can see in this article titled um, The Sani Institute of Paleobotany and Mrs. Sani, uh, published in 1958 in the Japanese newspaper Asahi Shimbun. Uh, by botanist uh, uh, Hattori Shizuo, who had met Savitri in Lucknow and who wrote, I quote, it was a noble sight to see this lady who must be battling loneliness as she has no children of her own, holding Dr. Birbal's memory close to her heart and devoting her life to paleobotany, despite the fact that she is not a paleobotanist herself, end of quote. Now, by contrast, uh, Pamela Lamplak Robinson was a paleobotanist who began and ended her career at the University College London. Uh, she shared with Savitri Sani a certain vocabulary of incompleteness that always seems to characterize public perceptions of their personas. Neither had children, and while Sani devoted herself to the memory of her husband and the promotion of paleobotany, Robinson's great love between inverted comma was considered to be her academic career. Uh, nowadays, hardly remembered, she was on friendly terms with statisticians uh, GBS Holday and uh, PC Mahalanobish, who invited her to India to set up a geological studies unit at the Indian Statistical Institute in Calcutta in 1957. Robinson was thus central to the promotion of scientific vertebrate paleontology in early post-colonial India and took part in a number of joint expeditions between the GSI uh, and the Indian Statistical Institute in the late 1950s and 60s that led to the discovery of Lystrosaurus and uh, Parapasaurus remains, as you can see in this slide and then also in this next slide. Um, the archival material on Pamela Robinson is very interesting because it speaks about her vision for promoting vertebrate paleontology in India. So, for example, she places a lot of emphasis on training Indian workers, um, as in the following passage in which she says, I quote, I should like to do what I can to continue to promote research and field work on vertebrates in India, as I feel that only when Indian workers are trained and interested in such work, Will it be possible for us to know something about the faunas which Gondwana rocks undoubtedly contain? End of quote. Uh, 
Uh, then she talks about the difficulties she encountered along the way, uh, many of which were related to her position as a woman in science. Uh, the bureaucratic structures of science in India, uh, where one had to negotiate the relationship between central and state governments, or the hierarchies between different scientific institutions, in this case, the Geological Survey of India and uh, the uh, Geological Studies Unit at the Indian Statistical Institute. Uh, I have already mentioned her attempts to secure casts of fossil specimens from Germany so that Indian paleontologists could have a comparative uh, material for study. Uh, but another interesting point is that she was very critical of the casteism, as she called it, that characterized British and Indian science, and that her position as a woman scientist appears to have made her more sympathetic towards other, even more hidden workers of paleontology. And I have here a very um, interesting passage in which she describes the discovery of Lystrosaurus remains. Um, if credit uh, is given to the young Satsangi for discovering the first skeleton of Lystrosaurus, and one naturally wants to give all the credit one can to young men at the beginning of their career, then equal credit should also be given to our 13-year-old Kuli Doya, who discovered the second skull and skeleton. Doya did far more work than he was actually paid to do, that is bag carrying, by actively searching for fossils for the baboos, and he found quite a number of things and quickly learned all the English names for, for our tools and equipment. So, and please contrast this, so this is a private letter um, to the description of the same discoveries in the memoirs of the Geological Survey of India. Uh, although I have to say that as, as far as I know, Robinson herself made no mention of Hoya in her published work. So she mentioned him in, the, uh, in this private letter. I might be wrong. I might still come across uh, uh, other records in which she might have mentioned, if not by name, just saying that someone else helped them. But in the meantime, this is what um, the publication of the Geological Survey of India says. Uh, the first Lystrosaurus skull with an almost complete skeleton was discovered on the 22nd of December, 1957 by Satsangi. The second one from the same locality was unearthed on the 31st November, 1957, the day on which Dr. Uh, Mulkraj Sani was also present with us. So uh, to conclude, these are just snippets of um, ongoing work. Um, there are other women I have come across uh, and whose lives I'm currently uh, investigating. For example, um, Meher Wadia, the second wife of well-known geologist Dian Wadia, or uh, Mary Stopes, um, the British uh, paleobotanist who is better known for her eugenicist ideas uh, and family planning work, uh, but who also studied uh, coal balls and even traveled to Japan at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, to do field work in a number of mining areas. And uh, I have to say that I have been surprised myself uh, by how many women I uh, found uh, in this story. Um, to return to the beginning, this is the image uh, I used to illustrate uh, my project when I started off. Uh, I think it's a clear indication of the skepticism with which I uh, have embarked on this project. Uh, but discovering all these women and their contributions to paleo sciences has made me think about how we write histories of science and how we also use the historical records that have uh, survived. Um, because to begin with, it's, it's not always easy to find information about women in science. Uh, there was an article a few years ago in The Atlantic about women programmers um, and their contributions to genetics in the US. And the, the researchers had to comb uh, the footnotes and acknowledgments of uh, scientific articles uh, to come across female programmers. Uh, but once they did that, um, they discovered, they actually discovered dozens of them. And so when I read that article, I realized that I had more or less embarked on a similar journey and trained myself to pay attention to things that I was often ignoring in my previous work uh, uh, with scientific periodicals in Oxford. I had worked with scientific periodicals as well, such as acknowledgements and uh, properly checking the names uh, of uh, the authors of scientific papers because we are conditioned to think of uh, authors as being predominantly male, and indeed, um, they usually were, uh, but not always. Um, as authors of scientific papers, women are fairly easy to identify uh, because their marital status is often attached uh, to their names, uh, as in Miss or Mrs. Um, other places uh, to look for are the correspondence of male scientists, uh, their memoirs and their obituaries, which often contain a host of references. 
to their spouses um, and the million ways in which they uh, either facilitated their research or conducted research themselves. So the question then becomes, what do we do with such information? Um, do we, and this happens actually a lot. So some of my students commented, <laughs> uh, made comments uh, uh, like this. Do we dismiss it as, as irrelevant because um, there were not many women in science to begin with. So the conclusion is that in the grand scheme of things, um, their work was not that important after all. Uh, or do we investigate further to try to understand what role these women actually played in processes of knowledge making and uh, institutionalization of science? And I'm hoping that by now it's clear what, um, which route I advocate. And uh, in doing so, I'm always uh, reminded of uh, Dorinda Outram's pertinent observation that um, the histories of science we produce should ultimately be about making our future. And then they should be able to withstand the real anger that comes from the past, uh, namely a denial of the idea that the future can be different. And with this, I thank you very much for your attention. Uh, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much for listening. Yes, yeah, it. <laughs> uh, thank you, Amelia, uh, for this. Uh richly uh, described and uh, well and cogently argued uh, presentation <clears throat> uh, uh, so uh, now we have uh, time for uh, questions and comments uh, so before i open uh, the floor for question answer a general announcement that uh, uh, the online attendees can uh, put their uh, queries, comments, questions in the Q&A box. And uh, uh, if they wish, they can raise their hand so that we can unmute them and they can ask as well. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, thank you for this uh, interesting. Uh, uh, and in fact, for me, it's a very a new kind of a subject. Uh, so it's quite illuminating uh, in that sense too. Uh, so in this uh, crisp uh, story of institutionalization of paleo science, it's global interconnections and, uh, uh, the, and of course, uh, the role of uh, women and how, to, how do we uh, reconceptualize uh, uh, the role of women in the making of uh, uh, this uh, uh, the early days of this discipline uh, in uh, Indian context. Uh, so two or three uh, queries I have. Uh, one uh, is related to uh, the brief mention that you made of Birbal Sahni's uh, <coughs> uh, take on uh, uh, basically a standpoint to look at recent human past and cultural interaction in the so when uh, so so uh, he is propounding a kind of uh, cultural standpoint that how to view recent history as a more kind of uh, connected uh, human history uh, which is now territorially uh, separated demarcated and so forth so uh, and he's also making expositions, basically a standpoint here, but maybe he's also making expositions as you, uh, the title of uh, one of the papers I saw, he's writing treatises on ancient Indian coins and so forth, or uh, other things. So is there any direct correspondence transaction of knowledge from paleobotanist or paleo scientists to the archeologist in the field? Uh, as such, because Lucknow, uh, I mean, basically United Province is the place where we have one of the early uh, uh, archaeologists like uh, Rakhal Das Bandupadhyay, uh, Rakhal Das Banerjee, uh, who is uh, there almost at the same time in this. Uh, uh, and he has written, I mean, my colleagues who work on or who know more about Bengali uh, texts they would know. Uh, so one of uh, the title of his novels was Pasanir Katha, mm -hmm. uh, the story of the stone. And so mm -hmm. so uh, one related to that. And the second one, 
it uh, the invisibilization part of uh, uh, the women scientists especially those who are not trained ones but informally so it's a kind of uh, uh, thing say so the informal labor doesn't count yeah so uh, so in the realm of scholarship those who do informal labor are invisibilized and those who do formal so in a sense it's more about uh, institutional institutionalization as such than about gender or the institution is made in i mean structured or the design of the uh, the scientific knowledge production or the design of this discipline is made in such a way that it is exclusive in nature so if you can uh, however uh, if you wish you can collect few more questions and then answer no, thank you very much. They're, they're brilliant comments. I actually just wanted to start by thanking Nigel because I noticed that he made a couple of suggestions and that he knows much more than me about uh, uh, paleontology and paleosciences in India. So all those are valid points. Uh, if you wanted to ask more questions, shall we, or shall I respond to Prabhat now? Because I, shall we collect more questions? Uh uh, hi, Amelia. Thank you very much uh, uh, for this very wide-ranging uh, uh, talk. Uh, there are a couple of things that I'm just going to park for the moment because those are large questions that we, if we have time, we can go into it. Uh, mostly to do with time and what Dipesh does with climate change and time and what you're doing with this deep time. Uh, on the specifics of, of what you're opening up, uh, it seemed to me uh, that other than the global circulation, what you have is uh, the scientist who produces knowledge. Uh, then there are a number of assistants who work in the field and we have some conventions of acknowledging them, uh, say thank you to RAs, et cetera. Uh, and then there are the institution builders who may not have been knowledge producers themselves. Yeah. And it seems to me that what you're suggesting is a decentering of how do we look at knowledge production yeah. in which the uh, quote unquote, the theoretical part need not be the most significant part of it. If, if that's what you're suggesting, it's a very radical suggestion yeah. Uh, yeah. across disciplines, not only across sciences. Yeah. And, and I was wondering if you would like to comment a bit more on how you see knowledge production in terms of institutions, theories, and, and the, what you're com calling the community of science. Thank you very much for the question. Shall I? Shall I proceed to? Yeah, you can okay. answer. Oh. Okay. So I'll just start with uh, Prabhat's questions. That's actually a very, thank you so much Prabhat for that point uh, about archeology span and Lucknow. I have to say that I, I didn't think about that. And the reason for it is because I so far I mean, two years have passed now, but so far I have only looked at the works of uh, uh, the scientists themselves, right? So I didn't actually look at, uh, I, I, I didn't have time. <laughs> That's the truth. I didn't have time to look at the works of archaeologists and to uh, actually see how the, uh, you know, works of paleobotanists or paleontologists might have actually uh, influenced uh, their uh, writings, right? Uh, but uh, it's uh, it's a very good point, and there are actually a couple of ideas. Some of them are also related to to uh, time, as it was already pointed out. Um, some of them also related to modernity. So, for example, uh, there are some interesting debates as far as uh, paleobotany is concerned. Um, I mean, we I noticed that. Uh, uh, Paleo scientists, let's call them this way, they tend to think about paleobotany and paleontology as belonging into one pot. But actually, what I noticed uh, is that the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th century, some people were very concerned about fashioning distinct disciplinary identities for paleobotany and paleontology. And in this context, they came to, they started to emphasize what, you know, what made paleobotany uh, different <laughs> from uh, uh, paleontology, why the study, what the study of plants, for example, could contribute as opposed to the 
study of uh, animals. So say in the context of uh, uh, changing uh, climate, you know, the animals are moving around more, whereas plants are not. So plants might be more reliable indicators of climate uh, uh, change. These are the kind of ideas that were floated around. And one interesting thing that they said with regard with plants was this idea of plant modernity, you know, that so paleobotanists were those scientists who, with the help of microscopes, very often they managed to penetrate the internal structure of plants and learn about them. And they found out that, you know, a plant could be uh, very old, but complex, structurally complex, and it could be historically modern, you know, but quite simple, which, so this idea, you know, of plant modernity, that is actually very interesting when you compare it to ideas of a progress in human societies that always seem to go from something that's, you know, simple tools to something that is actually, you know, becoming more complicated and complex, you know. So we become more modern. And then, uh, so this, this kind of uh, ideas, I thought there are overlaps, you know, with, with, with history uh, that might be interesting to study, but unfortunately I have to say that today I haven't cross, come across any clear example of how this kind of ideas, you know, from science might have been used in different contexts, like for example, the writing of history. What is interesting, what you find is concepts of evolution. For example, if you look at Vishnu's uh, avatars, right, at an avatars, and uh, there were some ideas floated at the time that, you know, if this might be, for example, in Monkaraj Sani's uh, work, he has a brief paragraph in which he says, okay, maybe this proves that ancient Hindus actually had a concept of uh, evolution, right? But that's it. For him, it's it's a uh, he's very much a scientist in the way he goes about it. It's it's uh, almost like a thought he has, but he needs to. He doesn't really have definite proof for it, right? So he says it is possible that it was like that, but we don't really know. Which is a bit different. If you just try to run a Google search nowadays, you know, for how these kind of ideas of evolution are used nowadays, you know, today is. This is really taken as definite proof that indeed, you know, ancient Hindus had clear ideas of evolution, right? So this is the kind of stuff that I am, uh, you know, working with at, at uh, this point in time, but I still, I still need to, to read a lot about it. About the question, the question about uh, the invisibilization, I, you're right, it's, a, it's, I never meant to say that it's uh, only about gender. So it's in it's very clearly about the hierarchies of science, right? Uh, so, which actually makes always valued certain kind of work more more than others, right? So it's but it's a very it's a very I think misleading idea of how knowledge production actually happens. It's never really, and this has been proven by studies in other contexts as well in the. Or Anglo American world, for example, there is a lot of uh, work uh, in that vein. It's never really just a lone male scientist sitting in the lab. There are a lot of, in fact, if you look back in the, um, in the um, 18 uh, centuries, a lot of these people weren't actually even conducting the experiments themselves. It's always other people who are doing uh, them, right? And so I think it's a very, for me, uh, uh, this is also then related perhaps to the last question. It's a very, um, you know, misleading way of uh, explaining how knowledge production actually took place. If you're just focusing on, you know, this lone figure in a, again in a laboratory, usually, you know, producing science and ignoring all the other people uh, who, who, who actually contributed in various ways and made this uh, process of knowledge making possible. Uh, so, to, to come back to the last uh, question, it's, I started thinking about this a lot also because I was involved um, uh, in, a, in a few uh, events that had to do with the decolonization of science and how to actually write a sort of history of science that you know, takes into account the fact that, for example, as I mentioned, the fossil record from the Indian subcontinent is relatively ignored despite its scientific and historical significance. Then there are also the fossil record is ignored. There are all these other, you know, hidden workers of paleo sciences that have been ignored and haven't really, uh, you know, well, despite the role that they have played in, in uh, the development of paleo sciences. So this is how it started off for me, being part of a, a workshop, for example, on a decolonizing uh, uh, paleontology. And we started asking and thinking about this question and, you know, how, how to write a history of science that is different from what we have had so far, because 
in speaking to paleontologists, for example, from India, as well, they often pointed out the fact that it, it is a real problem, the fact that they cannot uh, access fossil collections and they do rely on international collaborations that are essential for them to study, you know, fossils that are basically from the Indian subcontinent, right? And so there are a lot of debates there again about what should be exactly like in the context of arts, you know, or other things that were rooted during the colonial period, what to do with this collection. Should we, you know, repatriate them? Should we keep them where they are? And so lots of very complicated questions to think about. Um, I don't know if this answers <laughs> your questions, but uh questions in q and a one is uh, uh from uh dr Ron, uh, ranu tomar uh i'm reading it out because uh, i can't see other, uh, yeah other audience i mean yeah so uh, so that everyone can uh, oh, stand yes, when you answer uh, how did you get interested into this field what has been your experiences so far when it comes to gender in paleontology in indian academic context please enlighten us to the aspect i guess you have uh, partly answered it anyway uh, so you can come back to it uh, as well uh, so there is uh, from one from our colleague prathama banerji uh, yes thank you amelia that was really insightful i was interested in your thoughts on institutionalization as being at the heart of disciplinary knowledge formation. Do you have uh, thoughts on what professionalization meant at that time in terms of criteria of research protocols and criteria of peer review, etc.? Especially uh, in terms of the global network of peers that come to be established for science, somewhat different from ethnographer informant and uh, theory archive binaries that come to be established in the humanities. Also very interested in what comparativism means in earth sciences as opposed to comparative religion, linguistic, etc. Uh, and uh, one more from Sambit. Uh, hi, Amelia, thanks for a very nice presentation. I have a question as noted by you, the disciplines of geology and paleontology in India had patronage from the oil exploration companies. Yeah. Do you think the partiality of the patron for the former had any role to play in the relative underdevelopment status of paleontology in India? Yeah, these are all brilliant questions. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, so how I got interested in this uh, field, uh, I mentioned in the beginning. So I do actually have a bit of background in science, I, but not in this field. Uh, I studied mathematics before I decided to make a last minute turn to history. So I'm not completely ignorant of science, but I didn't actually have any background in uh, paleontology or paleobotany. And as I explained at the beginning of the talk, it's really um, emerged this project out of a, of a footnote reference in my first uh, monograph about uh, telecommunications and journalism in India when I became interested in one of the protagonists in that book and I just started to look uh, uh, into his life story and uh, then I was fortunate enough to get in touch with Professor Ashok Sani so that's how the project developed by finding more and more information uh, about it and uh, finally realizing that uh, I could actually write a, a book about it um, and for the second part about experiences of gender in paleontology, I'm still, as I mentioned also during the talk, I am uh, actually uh, trying to build uh, an archive of interviews with uh, uh, Indian scientists, many of whom are uh, women. Uh, and it's on my uh, website. If you Google it, you will, I think you will easily find it. And uh, you can read. Uh, 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 there, are only, there are not many at this point in time. I still have a few in the pipeline because we were delayed a bit uh, because of the pandemic. But you can actually read uh, about uh, their experiences uh, uh, in the field, what kind of research topics they're working on. As I said, international collaborations, how they became interested in, in uh, uh, the study of uh, geology and you know, uh, paleontology in India. They're all very interesting uh, 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 stories, uh, which I encourage you to read. Um, the second about uh, institutionalization as being at the heart of, I, I have to say that this is not, um, I, I wouldn't want to make that argument that, you know, it's uh, at the heart of art of disciplinary knowledge. It just happened, you know, that I, start, I started off by focusing on the uh, BSIP, 
uh, and so I ended up working on these two institutions. Then I uh, realized that the Geological Studies Unit at the Indian Statistical Institute also played an important role uh, in uh, 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 processes of knowledge formation around uh, vertebrate paleontology, right? And in fact, um, it's something that I, I didn't know, but when I spoke to this, um, uh, to Dan Grigorescu, the Romanian paleontologist who visited India in the uh, 1970s, early 1970s, he was well aware of the role of the uh, uh, geological studies unit. He was well aware of the school of uh, uh, paleontology that uh, Pamela Robinson uh, established there. So I ended up work focusing on institutions. Right, so I had to <laughs> write a story that you know sort of privileges them, but in the meantime, in, in the same time, I'm trying to understand how other types of you know knowledge making actually played into this process and not neglect them. Um, this is a very interesting story on uh, professionalization, what it meant at the time in terms of criteria of research. So it meant the um, uh, for example, the, the, um, the stronger associational culture, this is uh, evident, for example, as I mentioned in the uh, establishment uh, uh, of the uh, uh, Paleontological uh, uh, Society of India. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, peer review, there are also some very interesting uh, uh, um, examples I found at the Royal Society in London, uh, how they reviewed, for example, uh, Birbal Sani's paper that he, papers that he wanted to publish. What happens very often, and I've been asking around, maybe, maybe Niger <laughs> knows a lot of things, maybe he, he has an answer to this, this question as well. Um, it's often um, the, say, the super, super, today we would call them supervisor, right, who actually submits the paper. So uh, in the case of Bir Balsani, very often uh, the paper was submitted, for example, by AC Seward, or in the case of uh, China Virki, as you could probably, I'm not sure if you remember my last uh, slide, her paper was submitted uh, by, uh, was communicated to the journal by uh, uh, Bir Balsani. So this is a kind of, you know, hierarchical structures with in which uh, uh, scientists operate. So it's your uh, mentor or your supervisor, so to speak, who is uh, uh, communicating your uh, your uh, paper to the scientific journal. It goes through the um, usual uh, uh, processes of uh, review. But of course, um, if you look at the private correspondence, people know each other. Right. <laughs> so, you know, when you're trying to, to uh, secure a fellowship or a scholarship for your student, you're going to uh, write uh, to, to someone, you know. So, for example, what uh, Bir Basani does, he writes to uh, Lady uh, Abla Bos, trying to convince her that uh, China Verki is uh, one of uh, his uh, best uh, students and that uh, he is basically asking her whether he should, uh, they, should they should apply for a, for a scholarship for her at the Boston Institute in uh, uh, Calcutta. And she she says, this is, I found this quite interesting. She said, uh, uh, I would be very happy to um, encourage her because she was also involved in, uh, uh, I'm sure, you know, in a lot of uh, um, educational work, especially with uh, widows. But she said, unfortunately, at the Institute, um, the biological work we are doing is not really related to paleobotany. So um, even from the response she gives, uh, you can realize that they were not, unfortunately, they were not so interested in this field of study. So she said, we won't have a scholarship for, for her here, but try with the Geological Survey of India uh, because they should be able um, to do these kind of things. And uh, uh, she said, people like Sir Ashtosh, Ashtosh Mukherjee, uh, they uh, uh, encouraged um, a lot. They used to encourage a lot of uh, uh, um, people who did original work. Don't you have someone like this in the Geological Survey of India who could do the same for her? So, you know, it's, um, um, it's a mixture of, you know, personal networks uh, and then uh, formal uh, structures. Um, what it means comparativism, maybe I can link this um, question to, to the last one about um, resources, uh, uh, the exploitation of natural resources as well. So, uh, for example, um, um, I think Pamela Robinson were, was a very uh, smart advocate for vertebrate paleontology in India, because I think, in fact, many of the scientists were really interested in 
doing pure, not applied science. So they emphasize the economic significance of this disciplines when it came to receiving you know, support from the state or from the oil companies, such as the Burma oil company, the Assam oil company, and so on and so forth, right? Uh, but so when Pamela Robinson is invited to India, Mahalanobish asks her in a letter, could you please explain to me how exactly uh, are uh, fossil vertebrates going to help us to identify the location of you know, coal uh, deposits and why is this relevant? And then she says to him that, you know, um, you can you have different strata and you can use basically fossils to correlate uh, strata. And I'm not explaining it very well, it's a, it's a long letter. And she says, you know, you should be able to compare, to correlate this with this uh, with the same strata in other parts of the world. And we have been doing this for plants, but she said with very indifferent results, therefore it is better to uh, try uh, uh, animals. And this will take a long time. So it's a program of work that will take at least a decade, uh, but eventually, you know, we will be able to, uh, uh, to do this. So um, this is what they usually uh, do. They use fossils for correlation purposes, then they compare it with uh, uh, other parts of the world. Uh, and this is how they come to, to establish uh, uh, connections. Uh, but there's a, this other very interesting example in Sumatera Maswami's uh, work on Lemuria, you know, which started basically from the distribution of uh, lemurs. Um, you know, in uh, parts of uh, uh, Africa and India, but then it was discovered that many of them were in Madagascar, which led to this theory that there was must have been a bridge, uh, you know, between Africa and India at some point, and then this basically was submerged, so it was a sort of a lost uh, continent. And then around this lost continent, many people, so paleo scientists, Tamil, Tamil nationalists, um, Euro American occultists, uh, weaved all sorts of stories of uh, of loss. Um, and yeah, was there anything else about the oil companies? Uh, so unfortunately, as yes, with the, uh, the oil companies, I was going to travel to the UK again uh, to look at the records of the Burma oil company, um, but I didn't manage to do this yet. Uh, a lot, however, of the, the geologists and of course uh, also some paleontologists were employed by the uh, oil companies. Uh, so this was um, an important uh, avenue of employment for them, and their work was relevant because they could um, uh, estimate where to uh, uh, make uh, uh, tests for drilling, you know, and so the, um, I think a lot of the, 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 the fact that paleontology didn't become so important uh, in India in the 20th century has a lot to do with uh, the attitude of the oil companies, but it actually has to do a lot with the attitude of the, of the uh, Indian state. It's my impression so far, based on the documents that I looked at, that the Indian state was not interested in, in promoting this kind of research um, if it wasn't, uh, as I mentioned, you know, uh, economically relevant and how it became economically relevant was, of course, in the context of the, you know, planning, economic planning, you know, because uh, natural resources were central uh, to those economic plans. And that's, that's how we got the connection to the Indian Statistical Institute. At one point, they were even talking about the application of statistics to paleontology. So that these are the kind of connections that make uh, paleo sciences relevant, you know, and that probably would convince the Indian state to invest money. But overall, I think, you know, just the idea of um, collecting fossils, for example, to put them in a museum, you know, to educate uh, uh, Indian uh, uh, children about their fossil heritage. It, at this point, at least for the 1950s, 1960s, I, there are people like Girva Sani who talk about this, but I'm not sure to what extent the Indian government was actually convinced that this was something they needed to invest money. So. I hope that answers your question. Um, yeah. So there is one more uh, yeah. kind of comment. Uh, <clears throat> uh, thanks for the invitation to rethinking community of knowledge. Yeah. Scientific curiosity and labor have a life beyond author authorship, yeah. but authorship makes it uh, way into history and scientific curiosity, labor, 
becomes undervalued, unnamed and lost. Politically, this loss haunts us. This rethinking will help us out of the present conundrum. Yeah. So, I, yeah. I, I really appreciate this comment, actually. I uh, Yes, it's, it's a very good way of putting your curiosity. And also the other thing that I was thinking about a lot is imagination and the role of imagination in science, because we often tend to ignore that. But it does take a lot of imagination on the part of scientists, and so I'm not sure to what extent they, they, they are acknowledging this. Uh, to reconstruct this past world, you know, it, it is a leap of imagination that's quite important in the making of science, not only in the making of, you know, a Tamil nationalist projects about, you know, a submerged uh, uh, land. Uh, so, yeah, it, it's a very uh, good point. Thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, that was wonderful. Uh, I don't think there is uh, any question left in the Q&A. Uh, so uh, I formally thank you uh, for uh, agreeing to give this wonderful lecture here at CSDS. And uh, whenever you visit uh, Delhi, please visit us uh, in CSDS and uh, hope to see you soon. Yeah. No, thank you so much uh, for inviting me and also to everyone who participated and asked questions. And I'm looking forward to meeting you in person soon, hopefully this year, later this year. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Yeah. Bye. Thank you.